Hello. Welcome back to our discussion of directing. Last time we talked about the history of directing in the 19th century and the works of uh, such luminaries as James Planchet working with Charles Kemble, and then of course uh, the great Georg II, the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, and his colleague uh, Ludwig Kronig, joined by the Duke's third wife, Ellen Franz, in setting up the Saxe-Meiningen players. And then, of course, we briefly mentioned Andre Antoine, whom we've talked about before, as well as Konstantin Stanislavski and Vladimir Nemirovich Donchenko and Vizivalad Meyerhold. This is where I want to pick it up now, because we need to talk about uh, a little bit in terms of 20th century directing. And so I want to talk about a few different directors, and I'll put their names up on the pad so we know who we're talking about. Always have to look for the spelling of this name. These are not in strictly historical order, nor in any other particular kind of hierarchy, but I do want to uh, briefly take us through some of the developments of these 20th century directors, starting with Vizivaled Meyerhold. Meyerhold started off, as I said before, as a student of Vladimir Nemirovich Donchenko at uh, a, a, an arts, uh, essentially an arts college of a kind in Moscow. And as such, he became part of the first uh, group of uh, theater artists who made up the Moscow Art Theater at its inception. Quickly, he became disenchanted with his old teacher. This sometimes happens. But he became uh, pretty good friends with Stanislavski and remained friends with Stanislavski for the remainder of his life. But uh, due to circumstances that are too numerous to go into at this uh, period of time, what happened was, is Meyerhold left the Moscow Art Theater, went to the provinces for a couple of years, and then came back at uh, Stanislavski's request to Moscow to work in 1905 to build a studio. The two men had uh, somewhat different motives in terms of what they wanted out of the studio. Uh, Stanislavski had the idea of building a kind of network of uh, theater similar to the Moscow Art Theater that would be out and through the country and thus provide a kind of uh, high quality theater to people out in what we would call the provinces. Um, Mayerhold, on the other hand, uh, may or may not have been uh, in on that plan, but he was directed to, or he was hired to be the artistic director of this new enterprise. They called it a studio and it was the first time really that uh, what they wanted to do was experiment with new kinds of theater and theater production. So they hired uh, new kinds of artists, young artists, to work in the uh, design and, and to work on the scenery. They hired a young uh, composer named Ilya Satz to work on the music for the shows. And along with that, Merhold wanted to do new kinds of plays. And at that period of time, these plays were uh, under a label called Symbolism. And he did a number of different plays that they worked on over the summer of 1905. And his way of working was different. Prior to this time, and, and this was something that uh, 
Ludwig Kronig had worked out, of course, with his German efficiency, was that when all of the performers came in to start to rehearse something like Julius Caesar, the director, in this case uh, Herr Kronig, would have everything laid out, everything would make sense, everything was ready to go, and so the director could stand there and say, you hear, you hear, you hear, in the same way that uh, an army officer could direct soldiers in terms of their placement in, in, on the field. Meyerhold in 1905 did something quite different. He started to improvise during rehearsals with the actors and saying, this is a situation, how can we go about showing it? He did not have a pre-planned um, way of thinking about what the rehearsal ought to be before he walked in. And this was something that was very different. And it was something that uh, has then taken off as part of what we would consider to be 20th and 21st century normative work within a rehearsal period is that oftentimes directors now will use improvisation, will not have every single move worked out before they come into rehearsal, but collaborate with the actors in working to find a way in which the performance is organically um, developed over the course of several rehearsals in the hopes that that uh, organic nature of the development of, of the performance will then translate into a more uh, connected and truthful performance when the audience sees it. That happened in 1905. Why didn't it continue? It's because of politics. 1905, Russia was in a war with Japan, and by the end of the year, uh, Mr. Stanislavski, as a uh, business owner, said, I can't pay for all of this out of my pocket and also take care of my family in rough political times, not knowing what's going to happen. And so consequently, they ended the theater. They also had artistic differences. There were some differences in terms of what Stanislavski expected and what ultimately was produced by Meyerhold. And so in the public uproar over what happened in Russia at the tail end of the uh, Russian-Japanese War in the fall and winter of 1905. In all of that, they really never showed any public performances of the work that Mayerhold had worked on over the summer. But the innovations that he started uh, had, had long, long tendrils to it. The other thing that came along in uh, Mayerhold's work was thinking about how we look at actors and how actors move. And so he developed a new style of training actors that he called biomechanics. Essentially, it was uh, paired, often paired uh, actors working together, sometimes actors working alone, doing a very physical, almost gymnastic-like sorts of movement that uh, was tied to some sort of uh, objective, you know, gaining an, you know, gaining an objective uh, end, throwing a stone, uh, 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 drawing the bow and letting an arrow go. All of this was done uh, with, with mind. They didn't have actual stones to throw. They didn't have actual bows and actual arrows. But in doing these different activities, what Mayerhold was working to uh, teach actors was not only uh, physical strength, physical flexibility, and those sorts of things which are fairly obvious, but working to train actors in certain rhythmic concepts in terms of dealing with how you prepare for movement. So if you think about um, if, you're, if you're at bat and you're at home plate and you're staring down a pitcher and the pitch is going to come, are you just going to hold the bat out? No, you have to come back on the bat before you swing. Same with a golf swing, right? Is you just, even with a putter, there's a little bit of a back swing before you actually hit the ball. And also true if, you're, if you had an ax and are trying to chop wood. And so these sorts of ways of thinking about how do you prepare for and how do you execute different kinds of movements, but also execute different kinds of tasks on the stage was something that Mayerhold was very interested in. He directed a large number of uh, plays by the time that the Russian Revolution and the uh, Russian Civil War occurred uh, at the tail end of the First World War. We're talking in the late 
uh, 19 teens into the early 1920s. Meyerhold decided that he wanted to uh, join the Bolshevik party. He became a Bolshevik, got very interested in agitational theater for the Communist Party, uh, but also was still interested just in theater for its own sake. And so by the time we get into the mid-1920s, we see a number of shows in which he's dealing with uh, both the physical expressiveness of actors as well as uh, entertaining audiences at the same time. And so there are two or three shows that people point to uh, for Mayer Holt's work. And really seeing uh, a very clearly a sort of one-to-one -one juxtaposition of how biomechanics plays into uh, play production, most people point to a production of a play by a Belgian playwright named Ferdinand Krumelink called, in English, either The Magnificent Cuckold or The Magnanimous Cuckold. And it's a sort of a comedy version of Othello in which a man is very jealous uh, about his wife, thinking that his wife is having an affair. And instead of, of uh, uh, strangling her, as he does in, uh, in Shakespeare's play, the husband, the jealous husband in The Magnificent Cuckold, uh, reckons this way, that if his wife uh, is having an affair, she would not be so bold to have the affair, affair right in front of his eyes. And so what he does is he makes her sleep with every man in town, realizing that the one man that she won't sleep with is the one she's having an affair with. And as I said, it's a comedy. And so uh, you see in pictures of this, you see the uh, very clear physicality of the actors on a, a set which has been constructed so that it's uh, not looking to be everyday life or environment like you would see in a, in a play directed by Antoine, but instead what we see is a, essentially a playground for actors, which has ramps and stairs and places where actors can run up, run down, be on all kinds of different levels, doing all kinds of different physical activity. And then, of course, his great masterpiece, it was considered to be his masterpiece, was his 1926 production of The Inspector General. The Inspector General is a, essentially a one-joke comedy, but it's a really good joke. It's in a small, out-of-the-way Russian town where the mayor of the town has heard that someone from the capital has come to take a look at them and see how the town works, but the person is incognito. They're in disguise, and so you won't know who they are. And so he gathers all of the town officials together to say, you know, we know that you do this, we know you do that, we need to clean up our act because this inspector general is coming to take a look at us. At just that time, when he's talking to the officials, two guys run in, uh, two of their buddies, who say, oh no, someone's here from the capitals, just checked in to the one hotel in town. And so everyone rushes out, and it turns out that there is a guy from the capital there, but he's an idiot. His, his name is Klestikov. He's not the brightest uh, bulb in God's marquee. And uh, when he sees all these people, the mayor show up, all these city officials, is that he thinks, oh, this is how they welcome all strangers to this little out-of-the-way town. And all of the town officials give him money, they give him bribes, the mayor's wife tries to seduce him, uh, the mayor tries to link him up with his daughter. All of these things happen. And then, just when you think everything, you know, it's all going to come up, uh, Klestikov's servant, his, you know, helper guy, says, boss, we need to get out of town. No, they love me here. No, we need to get out of town. And they get out of town. Just in going out of town, Klestikov has written a little letter to a buddy of his talking about this wonderful town he's visited. The mayor is thinking, my gosh, I'm going to be connected. I'm going to go to the capital. I'm going to be a huge big shot now. Everyone is thinking, boy, they got out of this. This was just the best thing ever. As the postmaster runs in with the letter that Klestikov had mailed, he steamed it open, of course, and read it, which he should not have done, but he read it, and everyone realizes that this guy was an idiot, not the inspector general, and that uh, consequently, um, nothing is going to happen to this. And it's just at that moment, of course, as they get a message that the inspector general has arrived. That's the end of the play, is the real inspector general now has arrived. 
and all of the town is stunned into silence. Bong. And so what Mayerhold did in this production is he reduced a large number of the scenes into a very small rolling platforms. Behind it were rows of doors and then on small platforms uh, that would roll out for each scene, he would put all of these different people on them. And so it was very uh, both pictorial, it was very expressive, and a lot of very interesting things were going on uh, in, that, uh, in, in that play. Uh, Mayerhold's end is terrible. Um, you may not be aware of a great Hollywood actor named Warren Beatty. He's a little bit of an older actor these days. In his heyday in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, he was a huge star doing everything from Bonnie and Clyde in the 1960s to playing Dick Tracy in the 19, I want to say 1980s. And uh, he's married to Annette Benning, who is a very famous actress. He's a director, actor, very famous. And you could think of Mayerhold being that kind of person in Russia in uh, the 1920s and 1930s. He is a big, famous actor, director, married to a very famous actress wife. In 1939, uh, the uh, problems that uh, arose out of the Stalin government and what Stalin was working to do uh, in controlling uh, Russia and specifically and, and also ever, all of the other peoples within what was then called the Soviet Union, um, made its way out in terms of massive amounts of purges, murders, political uh, jailings and, and all of those sorts of things. So in 1939, Mayor Holt's arrested in the middle of the night, essentially taken off to the KGB headquarters in Moscow, where he's tortured for several months. His guards pee on him uh, on a regular basis. He's uh, regularly beat with rubber truncheons. Um, he, they pour, you know, water on his uh, on his bruises, so it feels like, you know, that they're just screaming in pain. The only thing that they leave uh, unharmed is his right hand so that he can sign whatever confession they put under his hand to sign on. And uh, finally, ultimately, in uh, early 1940, he's shot in the basement. They take his body out, partially burn it, throw it into a pit uh, back of the KGB, and that uh, is what happened to him. Um, why were the reasons for this? Uh, there are probably a variety of different theories, which again, can't go into at this because we don't have time to. But the one thing I would say is that there's one uh, biography written of Stalin in the post-Soviet period in which uh, Stalin, after World War II, is having a dinner party not long before he himself passed away and Mayor Holt's name came up. He was a non-person for a lengthy period of time. And Mayerhold's name came up and Stalin said, well, I probably didn't have to kill him. Uh, and uh, Mayerhold's wife was an actress, uh, Zenaida Reich. And uh, Reich was found in their apartment with multiple knife wounds and her eyes pulled out, still alive. She was left alive in that state. She died in the hospital. And the official word was it was just hooligans. That's all it was. Hooligans. So that is the sad ending to the story of one of the great directors of the early 20th century, Vesivalit Mayerhold. Uh, he had a great deal of influence, uh, he and uh, Stanislavski, both on a Polish director named Jerzy Grotowski. Jerzy Grotowski worked in Poland and came to worldwide fame in the 1960s and into the 1970s. And one of the things that he was very interested in was taking away all of the trappings of theater. And so there was the notion of what uh, some people called or what he called poor theater. Theater that didn't have all of the excesses and people were very uh, taken with that. He did a number of shows with a group of very committed and talented uh, performers in Poland and, and they took those shows all over the world, brought them to America. And so a number of American directors and actors became uh, very interested in what Mr. Grotowski was doing and it helped influence 
uh, a number of folks in terms of what they were doing in terms of experimental theater also in the 1960s and 70s in America and other countries throughout the world. Uh, I'm going to come back to Ariana Manushkina here in a second. Uh, Giorgio Strehler, uh, an Italian director, Giorgio, you get that notion that he's Italian. Uh, Giorgio Strehler was the artistic director for the Teatro Piccolo uh, for a number of years, an Italian theater. And one of the things that he did, which he was very interested in, was bringing back the traditions of the Commedia dell'arte. And so he directed a very famous production of a Commedia play called Servant of Two Masters. And in that, he reawakened and, and brought back uh, that uh, that form of theater, which is very interesting and uh, a huge amount of fun. Uh, I got to see a uh, remounting of that uh, production, uh, goodness, it was about 10 years ago now, maybe even a bit, bit longer than that, and it was just enormously funny and enormously pleasing to see uh, this Commedia dell'arte and, and uh, these actors working in this way. Then we have uh, the two Peters, Peter Stein, uh, who is a German director, and Peter Brook, who is uh, originally from England, but has spent the last several decades working out of a theater in Paris, as well as occasionally bringing productions to the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York. Peter Stein, a German director who has uh, been the recipient of all kinds of different traditions and has directed theater and opera throughout the world, and Peter Brook made a name for himself in England in the 1960s with uh, several Shakespearean productions. Uh, first, he worked for uh, the Shakespeare Memorial Theater in Stratford-upon-Avon and did a number of productions there. But then what he did was he was very interested in looking at uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. He had an idea that you could tell a different kind of story. You could tell that story in a different kind of way. And so he, he mounted a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, which uh, was very different. He didn't have uh, people running around necessarily in uh, realistic Greek costumes or realistic Renaissance costumes. What he did was is he put trapezes up in essentially a white room. And part of it was some influence from Grotowski, some influence from other folks, and just his own natural creativity. We shouldn't just say, you know, we're influenced by someone, but he had the, the, the foresight to also, uh, along with Grotowski, of saying, what do we actually need to put on a play? And so consequently, one of the things that he's been working with over the course of the last several decades is actor training and, and working to find a way that uh, performers can be so committed to what they're doing that it, it has maximum ex expressivity for an audience. Um, in the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, uh, he did a play that uh, he and a group of actors had worked on based off of the Gilgamesh uh, epics and some uh, other kinds of uh, ancient epics from India, uh, you know, from almost what we would call prehistoric times, these very ancient stories and working to see how they work together and using those to create a piece of theater. Uh, he's done uh, also some of the works of great literature, you know, Hamlet, The Cherry Orchard, etc. And each of these performances, sometimes he'll have international groups of actors in which the actors are speaking their own home language uh, and so have a really polyglot notion of how the play goes. So that you might not have all of the characters in the play speaking even the same language. It's a very interesting way of thinking about theater. Coming back to Ariana Manushkina, uh, Greek background, and I don't know that I'm necessarily pronouncing her name correctly. I do the best I can with my very bad Greek pronunciation. Um, but um, she uh, came, like I say, from a Greece back, Greek background, uh, but is wound up in Paris with a theater called the Théâtre des Soliers, the Theater of the Sun, not Cirque Soliers, not Circus, but Théâtre, uh, the Theater of the Sun. And over the number of years, 
uh, they've done a number of works together uh, that she has collaborated with them on. And it, I got to see one of their performances in New York, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was held in a huge, huge building. And so what they did was is they essentially replicated their experience from France inside this building. And what you did was is you walked in and... Uh, the director herself might be the person who helps take your tickets. But you walk past and you see all of the actors getting ready for the show. The show that I went to go see is Les Ephemera. And what it was uh, for us as the audience is we came in and there were two banks of, uh, of seating, which were benches, that, that rose up sort of like on the same way that if you've uh, thought about a surgical operating theater, that came up... And there was a center lane in between the two banks of seats. And through that uh, center lane, what they did was they had rolling platforms that continually and continuously rotated. And so you saw that the world kept moving and the actors on the uh, platforms acted as if nothing was different or strange. And so as the platforms continually rotated and moved through, what you would see are uh, the actors from lots of different angles all the time. It was a very, very interesting uh, experience. And uh, also, the other thing about the show is that as we watched uh, the play, is that the play was continually uh, accompanied by music, by live music. Uh, musicians who who played music while it was going on uh, and they used some recorded sound uh, to bolster the the live musicians but it was it was that combination of of live and recorded but it was always music going on underneath the whole of the show which made it very very expressive and very interesting to watch so here we have some of the great 20th century directors Vaziva led the mayor hold Jerzy Grotowski, Ariana Manushkina, George Ostrailer, Peter Stein, and Peter Brook. And there are several others, of course. Uh, I haven't included any of the great American actors, from George Abbott to Hal Prince uh, to Harold Kluerman. Uh, you know, there are, there are many, many uh, great American directors as well. But uh, these direct, those you will tend to read about, you know, if you pay attention to the New York Times or something like this. But these are directors who uh, had great influence on world theater and continue, some of them, to work to this day. So what did they do? They made a cast and they told a story. But how they told the story and what they thought they were doing in telling the story is something we're going to talk about briefly next time. Thank you.